because we're just flavoring your life. I'm looking to be what is alongside you when you're editing those moments that are going to make Final Cut. This is The Drinking Buddy Show, where we explore food, craft beverage pairings, and the entrepreneurs and tastemakers behind them. I'm Frank Rogers, founder of Drinking Buddy Artisan Snacks. And on today's show, I'll be chatting with Jeff Lozano, brewer for Ballast Point Brewing Company, listening to his journey from brewing floors to brewing world-class beers, and having him create three perfect pairings for summer. I've been with Ballast Point for about eight years now. And I came from the medical world. I was actually a nurse before I decided to to hang up the stethoscope and pursue. I kind of dabble at the time. I wanted just to dabble in the world of craft beer. So oh, I grew up in the Imperial Valley. So if, in California, my hometown shares the border with Mexicali, Mexico. It's a little town called Calexico, right? And the closest thing to a big city was San Diego for us. So I guess everybody that wanted to, to make it, you would venture out to San Diego to live the big city life. And so I did. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, except I knew that nurses made a lot of money. I really, it was, so, it was driven by what I thought was going to provide a decent wage and therefore a de- decent life, right? And so I came to study here in San Diego. It was one of those kind of independently owned schools. It's okay. kind of like the University of Phoenix where um, you pay a little bit more, but you get expedited. There's a lot to digest and a lot of work, but you can kind of get in and get out rather quickly. So I went to nursing school. And while I was going to nursing school, we want to drink the SARS away sometimes, late nights of, of studying and stuff. So San Diego was a place where I was introduced to craft beer. I had no idea what the hell craft beer was, dude. Craft beer to me was Newcastle. I remember picking up a Newcastle and going, look at this. I felt sophisticated. I thought I was no knock on Newcastle. I love Newcastle. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, just, that, they've been around. Yeah, they've been around. And so that was kind of my first venture into beers that weren't mass produced American style lagers. When I was in San Diego and going to school, I had a part-time job at a restaurant and I was working at a pizza joint here in San Diego and we, and we sold craft beer there. And I had no idea what the hell it was, but we sold Stone. I remember selling Lightning, Hefenfeisen, San Diego. I remember selling Ballast Point. In fact, my first introduction to Ballast Point was Yellowtail and Calico, as they were known at the time. Now it's California Kolsch and California Amber. And then we had some Lost Abbey, we had some Stone and all that, all that jazz. But the one thing that got me was Red Trolley from Carl Strauss. I remember drinking that beer and going, hmm, this is a little different. This is actually, this is actually really good. This is, it had a different complexity. It was a well done amber ale. So it kind of wet my whistle and kind of started changing my palate in a weird way. And then Stone Arrogant Bastard came into play. That thing was just, I was drinking that purely just based on Oh, you said I can't handle it? I can handle it. I'll show you. But inevitably what happens is that your palate gets destroyed first off, but you develop a new kind of affinity for the kind of taste that craft beer can have. And so that really started getting me a little bit more interested in the world of craft beer. And so I made a decision right when I was graduating. I had to ask myself a real serious question because I had thought about beer for so long at this point that and by the way i had no idea what the craft beer industry was i thought it was everybody's getting drunk everyone's having a great time everyone's just you know whistling while they work i thought it was like yeah yeah yeah. no actual work involved (laughs) no actual work i thought it was just like uh the chocolate factory except it's just booze you know rivers of booze and so i remember looking at what i thought the industry was and knowing what the nursing world was and by the way I loved nursing and I thought it was a great environment. I loved helping people and I was fairly good at it. I think I had, it was just something that most nurses have is that you want to help people. I just kind of started thinking about whether I could help people in a different way. And so I realized that living in San Diego, especially in order to make a living, the wage that I would have been making as a nurse looked really nice. I was a male bilingual nurse and they were kind of in demand. And so I knew that job placement was going to be fairly easy. And I had no wife, I had no kids. I had no real, nothing keeping me from adventuring though and exploring. And so I asked myself a real serious question. I was a little bit younger and I go, well, this career, nursing, is going to basically build a scaffolding for the rest of my life. I'm going to inject myself into a particular lifestyle. And I knew that about myself. I knew that I was going to be able to afford certain things. 
I was going to be able to afford a house, car. And then by the time I wanted to start a family, it's not so easy to go ahead and say, hey, I want to, I want to throw it all away for a little bit and, and go give this beer thing a shot because entry level is you know, minimum wage. I mean, you're working, it's a production facility, it's a factory. And going in with zero experience, I had no experience. I was never a home brewer. Up to this day, I don't think I've home brewed more than once in my life. Everything else has been in a little bit more of a professional setting. And so I said, well, I can just dabble in it now. And if I like it, I can always, I can stick around. If I don't like it, then I can go ahead and give this whole degree thing a, a shot, right? My dad wasn't really happy about it because, you know, it's not like I didn't pay, we didn't pay for the school. So when I settled on that decision, I started reaching out. Dude, I reached out to every single brewery that you can think of. I was willing to relocate at this time too. So I, I was sending applications to Dogfish Head. I was sending applications to Rogue. I was sending applications to all these cool breweries that I was interested in, seeing if they were hiring. And at the time, it was very different. It was kind of like 2012, right? And so the entry level was, do you want to work? In my mind, it's like you didn't need any experience. You know what I mean? Like you could just apply for brewer and they show you how to brew and, and you're good. It, a lot has changed since then in the world of craft beer, at least. And I realized that I wanted to do it a very particular way. I wanted to do it from the ground up. I wanted to make sure that, that I, I was going to be very comfortable with the lowest rung on the ladder, right? The bottom. I didn't intend for that to happen, but I was kind of ready for it. So I sent out all these applications. I was getting nothing back, nothing. I, I was getting, sorry, we're not hiring at this moment and stuff like that. And I applied to Stone like 20 times. 20 times, dude. I, got, I have like 20 rejection letters. And it's not rejection. It's just like, hey, thanks for your interest, but we're not hiring at this, right, right. At this point in time anymore. And I really wanted to work for Stone at the time. I remember because they were cool. The whole image, the gargoyle, the beer was like, my music preferences are very punk rock oriented, right? Okay. So to me, it was like, oh yeah, dude, this is the place I want to be. Like them in Rogue to me were like, like the punk rockers in the scene, but I couldn't get in with Stone. And I'm really now glad that I got those rejection letters because I love Stone, but I did get a response email the first time that I applied to Ballast Point. And I'm embarrassed to say that they were not on my top five. I was selling Ballast Point at the restaurant at the time when I was going through school and I liked their beer, but the whole vibe wasn't my vibe. You know, it was fish and fishing and stuff like that. And, and I wasn't really into it, but the Very beer was good. But at the time I wasn't ready. That wasn't calling my attention. But I said, screw it. I wanted to work for a brewery. At that point, I was getting rejection letters left and right. I was just, I just want to work for a brewery, dude. Let me try Ballast Point. And I had no idea who these people were. So I just went into the website. I got the list of names. Jack White was on there. I sent Yusuf Cherney an email, like the guys that started it. I wasn't even reaching out to their production managers or anything like that. I was reaching out right to the big boys and, and I didn't see anything of it. So I got a response actually from a gentleman by the name of Jim Buechler. He entered Ballast Point um, a little later in Ballast Point's history. And he kind of came in and started it was right when Ballast Point was kind of gearing up to expand and it was really starting to go full throttle. And he got back to me and said, hey man, look, we got a position open if you want it. And I go, yeah, whatever it is, I'll do it. Whatever it is, tell me when I need to go in and get interviewed and stuff like that. And so he did. And the position I later found out was for a facilities coordinator, which is a really cool way of saying janitor. And I was the janitor. and I was not only the janitor, the position was for graveyard weekend janitor. I still had to keep my day job for a little bit and then I would leave on a Friday evening and then rush into the brewery so that I could clock in at 9.30 at night to clean the place up. And it was only me and one other guy there because it was right when they were starting to begin going into 24 seven production. I kind of got in there and I was one of the first guys on that shift, but as a janitor on the weekends. and. Man, it was, it was awesome. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I thought at that moment, I was the luckiest guy to be working for a brewery. And I walked into Bell's Point. I remember the first time that I got, where I realized that I was in the right place. I'm walking in, I'm pushing my cart with my brooms and my cleaning supplies and, and my trash bags and stuff. 
and no effects is blaring out of the speakers, yeah. dude. There's a brewer just running around like he has his head cut off. It was Alex Tweet, the guy that founded and owns Fieldwork Brewing. And I just remember he's all tatted up and I was like, whoa, this is not the nursing world. You can have tattoos and stuff and you, you can blare no effects and you're making beer. This is totally foreign to me. This is so weird and I love it. And that was kind of like my first real introduction to craft beer and the rest is kind of history. I mean, I, I've done everything that there is to do except own Battles Point at this point. But yeah, it's, it's fun. I've done everything from cleaning kegs, packaging, cellarman, filter technician, brewer, specialty brewer. I've taken on a few projects for Bells Point that things that I wanted to do on my own. So it's been really fun, man. I've, I've been able to do a lot and meet a lot of great people along the way. What's really exciting about it and the industry in general is you've been there eight years now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think about other industries. And do you think in another industry, or if you were still in the medical field, where would you be in eight years? Would you rise up that quickly? Some places, if you started as basically a janitor, would they even let you up? You know, yeah. Some places you can go like, oh, well, you, you know, you don't have the training. That's the environment that I think we're in now as far as the craft beer scene. You need to have more to bring to the table. I mean, brewers are brewing at such a high level right now. And when I say high level, I just mean that you kind of want people that can plug and play. So they're plucking these guys out of the UC Davis program, out of these brewing programs. USD has a program. And so you're getting a lot of competition out there from all these people that want to go into the brewing scene. The only benefit I think though, is that you still have a lot of people that are willing to do the grunt work. And there is a room for moving up in a brewery. That has never gone away. You just, you got to have the right attitude the right work ethic, because at the end of the day, a brewery is a production facility. And in my experience, I think I was there for very, very different reasons. I know a lot of my coworkers and a lot of my good friends now went in there. Some needed a buck. Some needed just to have a job and it's kind of their opportunity. Other people really loved homebrewing. So they got into it with expectations of being a brewer. And then they realized that you don't have a lot of the creativity that you once had as a home brewer, it's, you know, you, you have flagships mm -hmm. and sometimes if those take off, you got to brew that time and time again. We were a sculpting factory for years. It's all I brewed, you know, but it's fun. And I was in there with a certain kind of mindset that I think that helped me grow in the company. It was a perfect place, perfect time kind of deal, but I also had the right attitude for it. It wasn't long before Jeff moved completely out of the medical field and became totally committed to Ballast Point. Psychologically, I stepped away from nursing a little bit before, like a month or two before I started to apply to breweries. And then I was very adamant that I didn't want to get full-fledged into nursing before I tried the brewing thing out. I didn't want to get caught up in that because nursing is not something that you dabble in. Like anything in the medical field, you just don't kind of just dabble it and have other things on your mind. You know, you, you got to, you're all in, you know, it's a mentally right. exhausting job, very rewarding, but you have to kind of be there. The hours are pretty insane. And so I knew that it was not something that I was ready to kind of half-ass. Um, I was either going to go in and get a job as a full-time nurse or I wasn't. And so at that time I said, you know what, I'm just not going to go all in with the nursing. I was picking up a few like per diem stuff here and there. Mm -hmm. So like assisted living homes and stuff, things where they needed like vocational nursing. And so I did that. And then once I got the interview for the facilities coordinator, that's when I said, this is something that I'm going to go all in on. And I absolutely loved it. And I've, I've loved every day since. Well, I think you might be hitting on the key to your success is the fact that you were either going to be all in on nursing or you're going to be all in on brewing. And you weren't doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Because I think a lot of people, you know, I remember when I was young and you do part-time jobs and stuff like that, and you were never all in. Yeah. Oh, I'm doing this for now. And you see that attitude on that worker right away. They basically believe this is not them. They're above this job and you're lucky they're even there. Exactly. That is that stepping stone mentality that I didn't have. This wasn't a stepping stone. This wasn't something that I was going to do in the meantime or meanwhile. This was something that at the time I didn't think it could really even be a career. I don't know what I was doing. I was just young and I, and I thought I could make something out of it. But then once I got into Ballast Point in that particular time, because there's war heroes right before I got in, it was a different Ballast Point. And some of the OG guys that were there, they have 
awesome stories and it was just a little bit of a different culture. But the culture that was beginning to manifest itself when I got in in around 2012, it was such a beautiful network of passionate people. One of the things that made me stick around and kind of bite the bullet because it, it, it was kind of tough to get paid minimum wage and only do it on the weekends, right? Like I wanted to be all in. I, but the fact of the matter was that something about enjoying the fruits of your labor is one of the most rewarding things that unless you kind of have done it, unless you, you can really resonate with it, unless you, you see your product and you go, oh, or you're drinking your beer that you grew and you go, oh, that was great. Or you're rereading, you're working on a novel and you're rereading a paragraph. There's something so just satisfying of being able to enjoy something that you've put some work into. And I was getting that in real time at Ballast Point because it was flowing from the tap rooms, you know, the, all the work that everybody was putting in from the cellarman to the brewer to the packaging guy. All of that was starting to become more of a philosophy than it was something that we did. To me, it was starting to become like, oh, this is human satisfaction. This is what it feels like. I think a lot of people don't get that in their jobs nowadays because they may be stuck behind a computer and they don't really get that satisfaction of something actually in your hands that you can drink and eat or something you can do for somebody where they thank you, like you feel like you just do reports and presentations all day. Yeah. And it, it gets kicked up somewhere and gets lost in a pile of paper. And you're just waiting there hoping that somebody recognized. And at Ballast Point, people were recognized and people were really very aware of basically the synergistic makeup of a brewery because it really is a, if you trip, I fall kind of world at a brewery. I mean, everything is so tightly knit together and departments depend on each other. If the brewer doesn't make the beer, the cellarman can't filter the beer, right? If the, the beer can't get filtered and it gets sent to a bright tank for conditioning, then packaging guys don't have anything to package. And if those guys don't have anything to package, sales doesn't have anything to sell. And right. it goes on and on and on. And if none of that happens, and I have no floors to mop at that point, right? And so everything was really like, oh, thank you for doing your job because because you did your job, I get to do my job. And because right. I get to do my job, you get to do your job, vice versa. At the end of the day, when you go out after an eight-hour grind, especially at Ballast Point at that time, we were going 24-7. It was fast. It, was, it wasn't fun. It wasn't like a fun brewery that you imagine where everyone, you know, like I said, is everyone's just partying and stuff. <laughs> it was a grind, dude. And that post-shift beer tasted so good to us every single day because we knew what went into it and we appreciated it. And it was a collective effort too, which was kind of cool. It wasn't an individual thing. It was a collective effort. And so when you were drinking it, you could taste what you had put into it. And then you could also taste what that department had, had done for it. And then you could taste what the other department. And so it was like this nice, oh, okay, this is really a nice representation of a brewery that's something magical and you don't find that in every industry because especially maybe the bigger it gets or the more disconnected it is from the actual thing. So you might work for a company, but you're a few stages up and you're just managing. You're rarely ever getting to see the finished product of what your company does. I don't think that's good for people in the long run. It will mentally distort reality for you because that's not reality. Reality is people want to get together. People want to be happy for each other. People want to make sure that they're being recognized and in turn, they'll do their job for whatever organization that they're working for. It's about value and people value themselves a lot, but you can start to doubt that value when no one else is. And I won't say recognizing because I don't think people really do need a pat in the back. I just think that they need that general sense of, oh, people get yeah. I'm needed and I'm doing something that's worthwhile. That's why when you feel like you're in a dead end job, it's kind of like, oh, it's always the same dude, right? He's just like sitting there no one's paying. He, like nothing that he does is really moving the needle in any direction. Starts to question when, whether he's going to stick around or not because his position doesn't mean that much. And if it doesn't mean that much to you, it doesn't mean that much to anybody because you're also in a position to make sure that you bring value and not just what you do, but the way that you do it. And that's very much in your control. You know, that was very much in my control not only doing the work, but I could whistle while I work. And I think that that can up the spirits a little bit. And it's contagious. Like in the brewery, I remember feeling it. Like when people were happy, you got happy. When people were stoked, you got stoked. When you were working hard and you wanted to get ahead, you got excited. People wanted to work hard and get excited too. And it was yeah. very, it was such an intimate environment too. And we depended on each other so much that 
one of the happiest things that I remember feeling, I remember feeling this dude. I'm really legitimately happy when my coworker got a promotion. When anybody would get promoted in the brewery, dude, I was ecstatic. I was like, yes, almost like if I had gotten it. And I got passed over a couple of times, you know, where like some guy below me would get promoted to the position above me, totally bypassing me. And I was like, hell yeah. It was really that feeling. It was just like, I had these imaginary zeros that I could see on my paycheck. Like I would look at my paycheck and it was this and I'd be like, all right. But in my mind, there was like a few zeros added to that because there was something a little bit more to it, something that you can't really quantify. It's the general experience of loving what you do as opposed to loving something to, to make a living. When we return, Jeff talks about where Ballast Point is headed and what he wants to do as a brewer. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. And if you'd like to support us, be sure to try our one-of-a-kind Japanese artisanal snacks and pick up a Drinking Buddy hat, coaster, and more. Go to www.thedrinkingbuddyshop.com and click on Shop. If you follow Ballast Point's history, we've been all over the place. We have been a roller coaster of people owning it, people trashing it, people praising it, people, you know, a lot of, a lot of people have their opinions about Ballast Point and who we are. And Ballast Point as a company has been, I think it's appropriate to say that we've had our ups and our downs. And the culture, which I think is a fundamental part of our success, we call it a new era of Ballast Point. We were underneath the Constellation tarp for a long time and we learned a lot from a conglomerate company like them. But all in all, we didn't see eye to eye as far as what the culture should be. And I don't know if the culture should be anything. It's just what the culture is. And you either like it or you don't. And the culture that we're starting up again is a little bit more reminiscent of the culture that it had when it first started up. And it was very much a rebrew what we like to drink kind of mentality. Brew what you like to drink and have fun. Don't go chasing trends. Don't go brewing something because you think it's hot. If you can read into it and realize that what we're actually doing is world-class beer, regardless of whether it's a trendy style or not, then you'll be okay. But our culture is really getting back to that, hey, we're making beer, guys. We're making beer. And if we're going to be making beer, make beer that you like. Don't make beer that you look at after it's done and go like, ugh, I hated doing that. And don't get me wrong, there's styles that people don't like. I don't like plenty of styles that are popular and that we brew, but I respect it because I know that it's coming from a place of authenticity. We're brewing it because we have a world-class team of talented brewers. We have R&D facilities, we're experimenting, and we're tasting the beer. We're deciding whether we like it or not, and we're going to run with it from that point, not from some consumer feedback loop. My goal as, as a member of, of the organization that is Ballast Point, because Brewing and then basically being a Jeff of all trades at this point. What I really want from this is I want to enjoy the rest of the years that I have left on this spinning rock doing this, making good liquid, beer, whatever you want to call it, and making sure that I'm meeting really interesting people along the way, having really great conversations along the way. The importance that I have on getting to know people is it's a priority to me. Like I like. I think it's important to get to know people. And I think that's a big reason as to why I gravitated to beer, because I really do think that this is something that brings people together. I could have been coffee. It could have been in the culinary world. I chose beer, but I do think that it acts as a facilitator to have great conversations like this, where we're exchanging ideas, we're exchanging opinions, and we can do it. And we're both enjoying it because we're sipping on some good beer or you know, we're in the tasting room at a bar. And to me, what I hope I get from Ballast Point and from this point on is a place where, where it could be a breeding ground of relationships. People that come into the bar leave as friends, whether you came in a stranger or not, right? You people sitting down with each other and where we can have a good conversation. Like I remember one time I was still the general, I was sweeping the or near one of the production lines. And one of the guys that was on the production line, I was new. So he goes like, hey man, what's your story? What did you do? And I told him, oh yeah, I used to be a nurse and stuff. And he looked at me like, dude, you used to be a nurse? Why are you here? What are you doing? Nurses make money, dude. Like, what are you doing sweeping the floor? I remember going, dude, do you have two seconds to jump off that line? So I took him to the bar. I go, dude, check this out. And we stood there and we looked at a packed house. This was in Scripps Ranch. And man, the bar was full. It was a group of rockers right next to a group of guys in suits. 
right next to a group of, of this and that. We had white dudes next to black dudes next to Asian looking dudes next to all this. And I said, check this out, dude. Everybody's here for the right reasons. Like everyone's just enjoying some good beer and we're all talking and everyone's having a good time. We had two blaring TVs and I go, dude, look, who's watching those TVs? Nobody's watching those TVs. Who's on their phone? Nobody's on their phone. The only reason I saw anybody on their phone was either to take a picture of their beer or to take like a, like a picture of their so, friends yeah. holding up our beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was such a beautiful feeling. Like, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm going to continue to put my effort into building this particular vibe, this particular culture out. It's a beautiful thing, man. That's the true spirit of hospitality. You want people to enjoy themselves. You want to create that space and you want to create that product that facilitates it, like you said. I think that's amazing because I feel like some beverages out there are, and some products in general, it's so difficult to enjoy them, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. you're expected to already be a connoisseur before you can even talk about it or go to a place that's dedicated to it. Yes. Whereas I feel like beer, even though craft beer has obviously elevated quite a lot in the last 10 years, you can still go to a craft brewery and it could be your first time and no one's going to give you a hard time like, oh. You don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, you, you don't know what an original gravity is? Oh, how to, like, get out of my bar. It's like, those guys get weeded out really quick. Because you have snobs in every industry, right? Like, you got beer snobs, you got wine snobs, you got French toast snobs, I don't know. But you, <laughs> those, guys, those, guys get, those guys get weeded out really quickly in the beer industry. It's such an approachable thing, beer. It's not too expensive. It's super well done. And, and as craftsmen as you can imagine, everything that goes into brewing a beer at this level is just ridiculous man and something that i learned along the way i had no idea that this much went into making this beverage it tastes delicious you can have a few of them and to me it just it's the perfect little accent on life it's it's a perfect way to flavor life and i've looked at it that way from time to time it's like or what we're doing here is we're just flavoring your life because you're going to have a bunch of things that go on in your life and you guys are going to have highs and lows in regular life i'm looking to be what is alongside you when you're editing those moments that are going to make Final Cut, Jason Silva, this dude that has a couple of YouTube videos, kind of coined it that way. He's like, when you're looking back at your life and you look at what made Final Cut, those are the experiences that are going to matter. Those are the ones that you're going to go off with, right? Those are the ones that are going to leave that impression in your mind. And I would like to facilitate those. I would like to be a part of those because any time that you cheers your best man at your wedding over a couple of these beers, we're a part of that experience. Anytime that you're having a difficult conversation with somebody and you say, hey man, you know what? You want to go grab a beer? I need to talk to you about something pretty serious. And you reach for one of our beers. I want it to be something that just flavors that experience and is a part of it. And that has been of the utmost importance to me in every part of what we do at the brewery from getting this label right. I just don't want anything interrupting those moments in your life because we didn't do our job. We went over to Ballast Point, we picked up a bunch of beer and they'd all taste like crap. Oh, what a, that's what you're going to remember us remember. for? I've had the best conversations, the hardest conversations of my life over a couple of pints. And so to me, when I look at beer, it's a different relationship that I have with the pint. And that's kind of my philosophy. And that's kind of what I want to get out of the rest of my life in the beer industry is like maintaining that and hopefully making that a culture in it of itself. Jeff gave me three pairings for a perfect summer day at the beach and threw in a few good songs to go with them. It's our rendition of an American light lager. I know that it got a lot of heat when we, when, when we released it because it is that particular style. It's supposed to be a light American style lager, just done a little bit more crafty, if that makes sense. Um, it's a cooler beer. I mean, look at it, the label itself. It's something that we've done a little differently from the style of beer that it is to the way that we've been marketing. It's a little bit easier I don't want to say that it's simple, but it is simple. It's good. It's drinkable. It's sessionable. That's the kind of beer that you want a 12 pack of. But we did see some room to improve what we consider just mass market, mass production, American light loggers. We did see some room for improvement. And why can't we make that particular style, which is a bona fide style, a little bit more craft and a little bit more ballast point. So it's super light. It's what you would expect a light lager to taste like. Practically no hop bitterness whatsoever little malt forward, a beautiful straw-like color. And it's something that you want to load up your cooler with at the beach. You know what I mean? Like you said, you can load it up, take it to the beach. You can go fishing with it. You can go to the pool. 
anything you're doing in summertime, it's easy to take with you. And if you're looking for a super crafty beer, like if they're saying they want something that's a lot more bitter, why would you want to drink that on a hot day? (laughs) (laughs) You'd be surprised, dude. Some cats out there are crazy. So what are we eating with this? Let's do some ceviche or some fish tacos. That's a good light lager. It doesn't carve into the fish because fish is so delicate. And what you really want is you want a beer that's going to be able to essentially scrub your palate with the carbonation. It's kind of like sushi. You want to take a bite of your sushi and then you want to scrub it. And the carbonation in the beer, the higher levels of carbonation in the beer help just kind of reset the palate. But the flavor of the beer doesn't overpower the delicate flavor of the fish little citrusy from the lemon or whatever you're going to lime that you're going to sprinkle on it. The malt forward breadiness of the beer plays well with whatever, if you're having a tortilla or tostada or something like that. And for the music, Jeff went with California Sun by the Ramones. Jeff now takes us to the Aloha Sculpin IPA. It's my absolute favorite version of Sculpin. I like OG Sculpin just as much as the next guy, but well, when we started kind of experimenting with Sculpin the way that we did, where we have habanero Sculpin. We have grapefruit Sculpin, which is equally as refreshing and enjoyable as regular Sculpin. It just has that accentuated grapefruit characteristic. We have pineapple Sculpin, not really my pine of beer, but a lot of people like it. We had spruce tip Sculpin, which is kind of like a seasonal, a little bit more wintry version of Sculpin, where we actually threw in actual spruce tip into it. And then we have Aloha. And that one was very interesting because if you really think about what we've done to our other sculpins we've just added stuff to it this one we fundamentally changed we changed it from the yeast to the grain bill and we've structured it in such a way that the flavor and the fruity citrus components of that beer are all derived from the yeast esters the hot characteristics the hop oils and stuff like that and then just the, the grain bill or we, we didn't add anything to it it tastes like we added this crazy fruit salad in, into it like it has yeah. pit fruit notes it has guava yeah. you have some pineapple in there too some natural grapefruit that just grapefruit is a staple flavor characteristic of that beer so you're going to get grapefruit on any variant of sculpin but that one was our injection into the haze game so it, it is a hazy ipa and that haze we've tweaked it here and there so it started off as a super hazy ipa but now it's a lot more of a tropical citrusy vacation ipa man like that's the beer that i want to be sipping on on the beach if i am going to reach for an ipa on the beach that's probably what i'm gonna do it it does send those aloha vibes you know what i mean so you're kind of chilling and the music I was asking some of my buddies the other day, I was like, hey man, Aloha Sculpin, what do you throw on the, your Spotify? Reach into that cooler, you're going to grab an Aloha Sculpin, you're about to crack it open, what's playing? One of my buddies said, California Sunrise by Dirty Gold. So anybody listening, tune into that one next time that you're going to get a Sculpin. I thought Bad Fish from Sublime was a rad, the sun's kind of going down, you know, you're not in the full-fledged, you know, high noon, the sun's kind of going down, everyone's kind of start to mellow out, people are sitting down a little bit. You reach in that cooler and you want something to kind of a little harder, put some bad fish, just relax, sit back on your beach chair or whatever, and then sip on that because it does have that chill beach music vibe to it. I love that beer. And the food pairing. Aloha Sculpin, hit it with Al Pastor Tacos. If they don't already throw a little bit of the pineapple in on the taco, just chop a little bit up yourself, sprinkle it on top of the Adobada taco, and then enjoy it with that beer. Dude, it's a beautiful pairing it's just the bridges that you build with those citrusy notes from the pineapple and then the citrusy notes in the beer and then the pastor has a little bit of spicy has a little bit of cinnamon and plays really well with that with the breadiness and the malt bill that sculpin has and then the bitterness it just plays really well with fatty pork and stuff like that do it so you're at the beach put on sublime bad fish pull out an aloha <sighs> sculpin ipa and get some tacos el pastor with a little bit Dang. That com- that, this conversation just changed my day. I might have to change my plans. So you've savored your ballast point lager in the heat of the day, sipped on an Aloha Sculpin IPA as the sun starts to set, and now you're moving into the evening with your third pairing, the Fathom IPA. So a lot of people remember that beer as a lager, as an IPL. We made the decision to change that one because it was finicky as a lager. Anything that's going to be so hop-heavy just kind of creates a very hostile environment for lager yeasts. 
So what we were finding is that it was very um, temperamental and we needed something that was going to be a lot more consistent because I fell in love with lager, IPL. Fathom for a long time was my absolute favorite beer. But then I even started to notice that, oh, okay, things change and you want a little bit more consistency. So we said, hey, why don't we just make it an ale and just keep everything else the same? And I'm so happy that we did. It just tastes so good. It's a really nice almost between West Coast and American style IPA. It's like an IPA. You know, you got your citrusy components and you still got your hot bitterness that's a little bit more of the showstopper, but you also have the malt backbone. It's not as silent as it is in Sculpin. It's kind of right there. You can even tell by the color. It's a little deeper. We have a little bit more of specialty malts in there, so you get a little bit more breadiness, a little bit more caramel notes and stuff. So it's one of those beers that I enjoy because you have to already like IPAs, right? So this isn't what I would consider your introductory beer for the IPA world, but I think it's a well-positioned IPA between a West Coast style, something like Sculp and something a little bit more bitter, like a sharp bitterness, and an American IPA, say like something like Bell's Too Hard Ale or something like that, right? Where one is a malt forward IPA and then the other is a complete hop show. This one I think has a beautiful balance right in the middle. And I like this one as the sun it's already gone you're winding down but you're not really winding down you still want to keep going the evening is rolling in somebody started a bonfire somewhere and you want to just relax by a beach bonfire or hang out in the backyard where you can still relax you're not ready to go to bed yet you're not ready to taper down you still want that bitterness it's going to amp you up a little bit but you also got that malt breadiness that is just going to nestle you right into that chair nice and easy And the juicy pairing? A nice gorgonzola burger with that IPA is on another level. And I'm talking like a good gorgonzola burger where you got, do yourself a favor, get a nice chuck, grill it to your liking, but slather some gorgonzola in there, let it melt a little bit, get some freshly cut onions. If you want, you can caramelize the onions. I don't think you can go either way. Caramelized (laughs) onions are, they link really well with those specialty malts that we have in the beer. But then- Fresh onion actually plays really well with a little bit of the sharp bitterness that the beer presents. So either way, you're good. But the real showstopper is the gorgonzola. The gorgonzola or the blue cheese, whichever one, you can link it with that beer. And the way that it plays with it, the bitterness through the fat really well, the breadiness of the beer and the malt on the caramelization notes really help with the natural caramelization mayored reactions that happen on your burger when you grill it so like a lot of the same reactions are happening on the burger that happen to the malt when it's at the maltster so those obviously complement each other really well if you want to slather a little bit of mayo on that thing too certain things are canceling out sometimes the onion might cancel out and so it will bring whatever else you have on that burger to life like if you have a nice ripe tomato or if you have Mm -hmm. some creamy aioli sauce or something like that do do yourself a favor make a burger to your liking, put some gorgonzola on there, take a bite, and then take a swig of that Fathom IPA and pay attention. And it's going to accentuate a lot of the components from the cheese, just the funkiness of it. It's amazing. I love it. Don't forget the music. My buddy said, when I drink a Fathom, he puts on Bossa Nova. And so he puts on Mas Que Nada by Sergio Mendes and Brazil 66. Look it up. It's super chill. It is like perfect. It's chill enough to uh, end the night, but it's also chill enough to up the night. Uh, what I said, I was like, oh, really? You want Bossa Nova? I was thinking Interstate Love Song from Stone Temple Pilots. Dude, once I reach into that cooler and I got a, an IPA like that, I'm not winding down. I'm going to chill, but I'm still going to hang around for a long time. Jeff lays out what it is about music that can take your food and beer pairing to the next level. Like whether you're going to go to the punk rock show, you're going to get a Paps Blue Ribbon, you're going to get a dirty martini because you're listening to jazz in someone's downtown speakeasy, sure. whatever. Yeah. You do it, but you don't really think about it. We pair music with food more often, or you'll pair beer with food, but you don't pair beer with music necessarily, or at least it's not as popular. But I think there really is something to it because music, just like smell, certain songs take you to a memory or a feeling. You'll remember the first time you heard that song or just you know, a special memory with that song. And it's a beautiful thing. The music component is like the food component. It's like if somebody comes over to you at the dinner table at a restaurant or something, they're about to grate some cheese on your pasta. Some people are going to be like, hey, dude, let it flow. Some people are going, no, 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 I'm okay. It's a preference thing. It's like, go, oh, no, I'm okay right now. This is the experience that I wanted. To me, it was like 
this weird knee jerk reaction everybody has just to get those um, a Spotify playlist like, hey, we're chilling. Hey, why don't you put on chill on Spotify? Mm. And it's like, oh, okay, I get it. You're going to get a lot of good tunes out of that to set the mood. But there's going to be songs in there. You're like, wait a minute. That's not the hell is that about? dude? We're partying over here like, dude. It can go from a ordinary Friday with your buddies to something that makes Final Cut. It could go from that to something that you never forget for the rest of your life. You don't know what days they're going to be, but when you put everything in order and you at least put some effort into the experience that you're trying to have, it could change your life. And it doesn't take a lot. If you were to treat more days like that, you would have such a more noteworthy life. You want to remember these things. And once you get into your own self-battle, self-competition with making your own days that much better and you want to top your last great experience and you're kind of in control of it then uh, i think you really start enjoying life man i think you really start savoring life like you should savor your beer you should savor the music you listen to you should savor your food you should savor your relationships with people and all of that is the same formula for a great dish of pasta for a great pint of beer you just got to get all these components pay attention to them a little bit not even a lot and then just put them all together and you get something like a well-balanced beer or a savory dish or a great song that's going to stand the test of time. You know what I mean? It's the same formula. Just apply it to your life. You can find Jeff on Instagram at Jeff Lozano. That's L-O-Z-A-N-O. And follow Ballast Point at Ballast Point Brewing. Jeff hosts Dedicated to the Craft, available from ballastpoint.com slash podcast. Coming up on the Drinking Buddies show, I'll be chatting with Yong Ha Jong, a Korean Seoul brewer from Los Angeles. Yong Ha will take me through the fascinating history of Seoul or alcohol and how young Koreans and Korean Americans are rediscovering their traditional home brewing heritage. Thanks for listening to the Drinking Buddies show. Be sure to subscribe and share it with your buddies. Check out our latest artisanal snack offerings at www.thedrinkingbuddyshop.com and connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Take care and drink well.